All right, good to see all of you today. Are you feeling good? I hope so. I hope so. I know there's a lot of feels in the room today. Before we begin, I want us to just start with a threefold prayer. Not just for this message or for this series, but I think we could pray this every time we gather. And the threefold prayer is simply this Lord, show me the truth about you today. Secondly, Lord, show me the truth about me. And thirdly, Lord, show me the truth of your will for me. How many of you think that's a pretty powerful threefold prayer and a way to approach everything today? Could we just pray that briefly, simply right now together? Just bow your hearts with me for just a moment. Lord, we just ask you in the name of Jesus to show us your truth about you. Help us to see you and truth as you are. Lord, show us the truth about ourselves. Help us to see what maybe we've avoided seeing or maybe what we've been blinded to about ourselves. And Lord, I ask you right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would show us your will for us and that by faith we can activate that and move in faith and experience your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Statistics bear out that there's an all-out assault on our emotions. Statistics point to the fact that people are not doing very well at all. And I guess that could be expected a little bit after these past 24 months. But I've had a sense for a little while that we've needed to talk about this. God created us in his image with a wide spectrum of emotions, right? For example, experts say there's 27 categories of emotions and, and they are expressed in so many different ways. I feel, I feel happy, I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel anxious, I feel anxiety, I feel depressed, I feel shame, I feel guilt, I feel peace, I feel joy. We feel. We feel and we are very complex beings. And if you don't know that, you don't have a wife. Beautifully complex, I will say. Intellectually complex, emotionally complex. And if I could say, sir, we are too. It's just maybe not quite as obvious with us men or quite as beautiful. For instance, um, when women say they're fine, <laughs> they're not. When men say they're fine, we really mean it, but we're probably not. I heard Andy O'Donnell say this week, when a woman says she's fine, it means F-I-N-E, feelings I've not expressed. <laughs> and in today's world, as you know, is so emotionally charged. There's always something new. There's something new to enrage us, to worry us, to cause fear. And many things, so many things that make us laugh and things that can sadden us deeply, quickly. Also, the ways in which we absorb content lends itself to an array of emotional responses. In his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman says that most of our daily news is inert consisting of information that gives us something to talk about but cannot lead to any meaningful action. In other words, it just simply stirs up the emotional pot and leaves us trying to sort out all these things that we feel. As an example, a 30-second scroll through Instagram, it can lead you on an emotional roller coaster or scroller coaster. You may see an image of a child in the streets of war-torn Ukraine, and it's heartbreaking followed by a video of a new litter of kittens or something that's so warm and fuzzy. Or maybe it's an ad from your favorite shoe company that you quickly go to and say, oh, I want that, I need that. Or then you see a notification that the stock market is taking a dive today. It's a roller coaster. And when you take the dizzying amount of disjointed, emotionally charged content that we consume, and then, then you add to that the fact that we are more individualized and more isolated than ever before, what is that? That's a perfect storm that's wreaking emotional havoc in many people's lives, and we just wonder why. 
Today, we're gonna begin this message and begin this series where we usually end the service. What I mean is most Sundays we close out our gatherings with a blessing. You know, it's, it's a blessing that, that is so, so profound and so important. It's found in Numbers chapter six. We call it the, the priestly blessing. It's noted as the priestly blessing in most of your Bibles, in fact. But Numbers six, verse 24, you're familiar with it probably, and if you're new to Chapel Hill, maybe not. But it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now, we're gonna kind of center around that for a few minutes, but I don't want you to look at the screen, I want you to look at me for a moment. If you're watching online, just look right at that screen, and I wanna say that again to you. And I just want you to kind of open your heart, open your mind to what these words, these, these anointed, inspired words of God, and how it causes you to feel and how it causes you to respond. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. We need him to keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon you, the glory and the wonder of his face and be gracious to you to give us what we don't deserve. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. I know that's meaningful for you because I watch you at the end of our experiences when I say that or one of our pastors say that to you and I watch you, many of you do this. It's almost like you, you, you do this as, as a physical sign that you want to receive that. Because it's full, it's full of God. It's full of blessing. It's full of what you know you need. The reality is this passage has a lot to do with emotional health. Because at the core, emotional health is a, a state of being. It's a state of being that God desires for all of us. So as we say that at the end of the service and we give you that blessing, we're saying this. We're saying go in the blessings of the Lord and go this week and be emotionally healthy. Go and be emotionally strong and enjoy God's blessings and God's peace and his joy. Is that not what we all desire? At the core of who we are, we desire that because God put that desire in us. But God doesn't give us those desires that he can't fulfill. He fulfills it through his word. Now, before we go any further, I need you to do something for me. I need you to smile. I'm, I'm emotional too, and it helps when you smile. But then, then I want you to turn to someone next to you. Maybe it's someone you know, or maybe it's someone not. But I want you to say these simple words. I'm happy to be with you. That's all. I'm happy to be with you. Turn around if you need to. I'm happy to be with you. That's all. That's all you need to say. I know you're meeting new friends right now. I played in a golf outing almost 25 years ago, and I had the opportunity to play with a pastor that I was that I admired and respected. I had met briefly once or twice before. I suppose he might have remembered me because of my unique last name as a, as a pastor. But he walked up to the cart. I was already at the golf cart when he walked up to me and he said, Dave, I was so happy when I saw that I got to play with you today. And I'm thinking, But really, what I felt is something that I've remembered for 25 years. That he, this man that I highly esteemed, let me know how happy he was to be with me that day. See, you may not remember what someone said 25 years ago, but you'll remember how someone made you feel. The blessing and the peace that's spoken of in number six is, again, the biblical idea of shalom that we speak a lot about. 
meaning wholeness, completeness, fullness, and fruitfulness. And I want that in every domain of your life. I want that in every dom domain of my life. I want it for my wife. I want it for my children and my grandchildren. I want that shalom. I want that blessing, that joy, that peace, that fulfillment, that wholeness that all comes from, comes from God. Let me break down what I mean. There are several main domains for us, or you could say there are five aspects of being human. They're coming up on the screen. Physical, social, spiritual, intellectual, and emotional. Say it out loud with me. Physical, social, spiritual, intellectual, emotional. And ignoring or neglecting any aspect of who we are always results in destructive consequences in our relationship with God, and our relationship with others, and even for ourselves. When I say destructive consequences for ourselves, I'm talking about relational loss, I'm talking about destruct, uh, destructive addictive behaviors, substance abuse, physical abuse, even it results sometimes in suicide. I don't think I need to tell you that suicide is one of the leading causes of death in America. In 2020, an estimated 12.2 million American adults and teens seriously thought about suicide. 3.2 million planned a suicide attempt and 1.2 million attempted suicide. What's that say to us? We have an emotional problem. And the global stats are staggering. Why is that? Because we ignore or we neglect God's will for our emotional health. And I wanna talk about that today. And so in this series, as we zero in on emotions and what we feel, we're gonna zero in on how Jesus wants to bring healing to us as he exposes the truth about us. He wants to bring healing and restoration to all those areas of our lives. So let's talk about, first, to feel or not to feel. Depending on your personality, depending on your upbringing or the circumstances, maybe, maybe even depending on your church experiences, we all come at feelings differently. Perhaps you grew up in an environment where, emotional and, where emotions and feelings were seen in a negative light. Is that your experience? Perhaps you were in a church, you have a church background, and it was inferred that to feel certain negative emotions was in some way a lack of faith. Anyone attend that church? If something wasn't right, it was your fault. <laughs> it was a lack of faith on your part. At Chapel Hill, we don't see it that way. We believe that it's okay to not be okay. But we also believe that's only half of it because we need to learn to be honest and open and vulnerable when we are struggling. So really, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to stay that way. Yeah, yeah, it's okay to not be okay, but we can't just live there. Jesus has more in store. He has more in store for you. He has a full life for you. What does he want to do? He wants to grow you. He wants to restore you. He wants to mature you, and he will do it in the rich soil of his word, and he'll also do it in the rich soil of spiritual community. Look around today. This is a community of, of followers of Jesus, but also we break down into little smaller groups of spiritual community where we can do life together. And what do we do in, that, in, that, in those smaller groups of community? We grow together, we heal together, we restore together, we grow and mature together. Perhaps your family or your father or someone directly or indirectly taught you that to show emotion was a sign of weakness. And so now you handle emotions by suppression. You stuff them, you push them down, you ignore them. Don't. Don't elbow anybody right now, that, that, that's not appropriate. Maybe you were taught, never let them see you cry. It made the news this week that the Braves general manager, Alex Anthopoulos, showed emotion as he discussed with reporters the new reality that Freddie Freeman will no longer be wearing a Braves uniform. I, you know, I can't get into that, so. Um... You know, it's a tough deal. You know, I just, again, I can't get into specifics. Um, you know, it just, I guess, you know, last night we finally said, look, we're going to try to move forward. I'm trying to get this trade done. And, 
see where it goes when we cut it done today. Alex, have you ever had a move in your career that's had so much emotion wrapped nope. up into it? Not even close. What? I mean, I know we can't get into specifics, but I gotta, I gotta ask why. I mean, just you know, it's um, big trading tough players away and um, making big trades, and um, you get attached. There was huge publicity because general managers of Major League Baseball teams are not supposed to cry or not to supposed, to, supposed to show emotion. But sometimes let's, you just can't avoid it or you don't even try to avoid it. Why? Because of all the feels. And you, and you feel it deeply and you openly express those emotions. Some of you might get emotional while watching a movie. Can you be honest and wave your hand and say, yeah, it happens. How many of you would be a little more honest and say, yeah, it's happened during a commercial? <laughs> no. no way. I see a man lifting his hand over here. <laughs> Cindy, uh, it's not uncommon for me to give Cindy a birthday card or an anniversary card and write a, write a little note in it. And just here they come. Here comes the tears. Here comes the emotions. And I'm like, it's a card. <laughs> But regardless of where you are on the emotional spectrum, emotions are a good thing. We're not fully human without them. Write this down if you're taking notes, and I hope you are. Emotions play a pivotal role in making smart decisions, also connecting with others, and connecting with God. Now, it can't all be about emotions. In some churches, you kind of get the feeling that's what it's all about, but it's not all about emotions. But emotions are key in connecting in a relational way. One author puts it this way, emotions are a bridge to another person's soul. And today's epidemic of anxiety and depression is undeniably linked to individualism and isolation, including the massive isolation that the pandemic brought on. Here's what we know. God created us as relational beings and attempting to process our emotions in isolation, it, it just doesn't work. Emotions aren't just a good thing, emotions are a God thing. Emotions help us to connect to God because God is an emotional God. I love the charismatic experience. I love the Pentecostal experience. I love it when we have music like we have. We can join together and we can worship and we can bring our emotions into it. I think that's Bible worship actually. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I bring my whole being into my, into my heart of worship. We see Jesus. Jesus. Revelation tells us he's the exact representation of God. And we see Jesus experience emotion in the word. For instance, he showed us deep, God's deep and unconditional love in his ministry with people. There was emotion behind that. In Gethsemane, Jesus asked the Father if this cup of suffering could pass from him. I believe that came from an emotional place. Jesus wept when his friends died. Jesus drove out the corrupt money changers in the temple with what? With a righteous and a holy anger. We see God's people expressing their emotions in the Psalms, emotions of grief and pain and loss and even fear, but also we see them rejoicing and celebrating in the Psalms. We see Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. There's all kinds of emotion we see from God, in God, and in God's people in the scripture. God created us in his image. But I guess the question is, how do we keep all of these feels in a healthy place? How do we keep it in a healthy place? I, th I think we all, all know that the feels can sometimes get too hot or they can get too cold. We can feel these great highs and then we can feel the great lows. And then when those lows are not healthy or they're not in a, a healthy place, they can go even lower. And when we don't know what to do, when we're on that slide going lower, they go even lower. And we descend into a place where there's now this heavy, dark cloud that begins to sit on us, it feels like. And we can't get out, out, away from it. We can't get out of it. It's just this feeling. And it's not healthy. I think maybe a healthy, helpful metaphor for us is that of a dashboard of a car. Under the hood of a car is what? It's a, 
it is, is a complex engine. It's got a lot of different complex parts working together. The dashboard is kind of a shortcut to getting essential information to us at a glance so we can see, okay, there's something going on underneath the hood that's either good or it's bad. It just reveals to us what's going on. I need more fuel or I need to put oil in the, in the car or the, the oil pressure is low, the tire pressure is low. Or sometimes the check engine light comes on and you know you've got a problem there. So, 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 so we've, we've kind of got that same dashboard. That dashboard is called emotions. So, so the tears start to come. Well, the tears don't just come because our, our face needs a bath. I mean, the tears come because there's something, there's something going on underneath. I talk to a lot of people and I'll have different conversations and all of a sudden I'll ask a question. <laughs> tears start coming. I'm like, thought that was just a simple question. But the tears indicate that there's something going on underneath that we can't see on the external, we can't see on the outside. What? And so I'll ask the question, I'll say, what are the tears telling us right now? Or when anger rises to the surface, the dashboard is saying, engine is hot or overheating. Something has been triggered. Or when sadness and heaviness overtakes you, maybe the dashboard is just simply saying, turn off the engine for a while. Talk to someone. Get some extended rest. In my late 30s, I once found myself in a very, very difficult place in ministry. I was pastoring a church, and I found myself mentally, physically, relationally, and emotionally depleted. I'd suffered uh, a series of previous losses. Even though I wasn't assigning those losses to my current condition, I just was in a place that I did not understand. And I felt this heaviness. I felt this fatigue and this weariness, this lack of joy and this hard, hard place. I didn't know how to articulate it to Cindy. It never once occurred to me that it was depression. It was just this hard place. But I had also been taught to pick myself up by the bootstraps and to get up and go another day. And so I kept going another day, going another day. And I remember one day specifically, I went to, to visit someone in the hospital. And at that time, we had a full-size van that um, we had for our, our, our growing family at that time. And I remember going out in that full-size van in the hospital parking lot and finding that little sofa bench and crawling up on that sofa bench. It, I mean, I'm talking, it's, it's the closest I've ever been in a fetal position in my life. But I remember lying there saying, I can't do this. I didn't even want to go home. And I found myself broken and tired and not knowing at all what was going on. The dashboard was sending messages and I just didn't know how to respond to it. 25, 26 years ago. I'm talking about something that some of you are familiar with. Some of you have experienced a similar thing. Some of you may be experiencing it today. I'm talking about the cloud of sadness. And that cloud of sadness can, can come on us and hover over us for multiple reasons. In a general sense, sadness is a signal that something needs to heal. In the same way that physical pain is an indication that something is not right and needs to heal, sadness is the emotional equivalent of pain. Sadness can feel heavy. Sadness can feel gloomy. It's like a rain cloud over us. Sadness shows up anytime there's loss. And here's the reality, and you need to lean in to get this. Sometimes that loss is super obvious. And we know we've had loss. It's the loss of a loved one. Or the loss of a marriage partner. The loss maybe of friendships. Or realizing maybe a friendship is never gonna be the same again because of what's happened. It's the loss of the best job that you've ever had. I lost it for whatever reason. Maybe it's the loss of, the, of your home for whatever reason. 
You love that home. But now it's gone. Then sometimes the loss isn't super obvious. Now this is what I want you to hear. And we just feel pain and we just feel sadness because it's not super obvious or wasn't super heavy. We just move on. But watch this. Over time, those small losses can pile up on us. And those small losses can create a deep sadness. And it can leave us confused because there's no major or there's no clear loss that's happened. It was just, it was just a bunch of small losses. Have you ever been talking to someone and you said something and you, you didn't say much? It was just kind of simple what you said, but all of a sudden, boy, they reacted. Maybe they reacted in sadness and tears. Maybe they reacted in anger. And you're like, what did I say? It's not, it's not what you said. That was just a little bit of it. It, it was the accumulation of everything that's been said. It's been, it was, it's been an accumulation of losses over time. And it just happened to be, this is the moment where it was all triggered. Where all of a sudden it all came out. And you were the recipient of what they felt. It, it just happens over time. Something's not right. Did you know that sadness is actually an emotion? A tool that helps us survive. Because you see, sadness is actually a cue. Watch this. It's a cue for you to slow down. It's a cue for you to reflect, to identify what you've lost, and then to mourn it properly. But we often don't do that. We don't mourn things properly. This is a fast-paced life. we got to keep going. Can anybody relate to this? You lose something. and We don't mourn it. We just keep on going, hoping the next new thing will fix what we just lost. Did you know that sadness is actually a tool for us? In fact, Jesus told us that, didn't he? Blessed are those who mourn. Sometimes we just need to mourn. Let me give you a word of caution in this cremation generation. That we don't allow the, what happens when a loved one passes and we choose cremation to allow us to just move through that process quickly and we fail to mourn. You know, those visitations and those gatherings are very, very healthy times for us because they allow us time to slow down and let those that God has assigned in our lives to come around us and help heal us and help restore us and help us grieve and help talk about what has happened and help talk about those joyful times, those sad times. But if we don't have those times of gathering. We've kind of pushed the accelerator down saying, I'm going to move through this morning time quickly. And that's what some people are trying to do. They're trying to get out of it when they don't realize they're moving into a more difficult place because you tried to speed up and go through it quickly. I hope that helps just a little bit. It's something I've been concerned about as as we become aware of many people who pass and very quickly things seem to be going on as normal when it's not. We need to grieve loss, and we know that blessed are those who mourn. And also blessed are those who invite other people in to those moments. You know, in my struggle all those years ago, I just came to a place where I had to talk about it, and I began talking about it, and I began praying about it, and I began to rest and get renewed on the inside, and God brought me up out of it. God wants you to give it to him, and sometimes we give it to him by sharing it with others, right? Psalm 34, 18, the Bible says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God cares about our emotional pain. He draws near and he invites us in to share our vulnerability and confess those things that we feel, and he wants us to say it to him. In fact, I would say this, when you have your quiet time or your prayer time, tell God out loud what you feel. You say, well, I don't know if he'd want to hear it. Listen, he already knows it. He just wants you to admit it and confess it and give it to him. He's close to the brokenhearted. He'll be close to the one who is angry. Share those those feelings of anger. Share those feelings of, of sadness. Share those feelings of loss. Share those things with God. He draws near and invites us to share our, our vulnerability with him, but also he wants us to share it with others. Confess your faults, confess your pains, confess your hurt to one another. Then you may be healed, he says. You know, this is what sets us apart as Christians from other world religions. In Christianity, our our God actually came down to us. God drew near to us as in the flesh in order to do what? To repair our relationship with him so that he 
can be close. And when he's close to us, he's close to us. He desires to bless us and keep us. He desires for his face to shine upon us and to be gracious to us. He desires when he's close to us that he would turn his face towards us to give us peace. So when he's close to us, all those things and that priestly blessing can become ours because he's drawn close to us. And all he's asking us to do is draw close to him. You draw close to him, he'll draw close to you. And he has all those wonderful blessings that we pronounce over you. But it's more than a pronouncement. It becomes a reality. And that emotional health begins to turn and begins to be healed and restored to a place that God desires it. Let me conclude with talking about the joyful light or the joyous light that's available to us. The Bible recognizes joy as a relational experience. Or let's think of it this way. Joy is about being with someone who is glad to be with me. I'm so happy to be with you. I'm so glad to be with you. I had a joyful day on that golf cart with Tommy Barnett because he sure acted like he was happy to be with me. And interestingly, joy has a lot to do with the face. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed, look at this, in the face of Christ. So when you think of Numbers chapter 6, verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. You could paraphrase it this way. Here it is. May you feel the joy of God's face shining on you because he is happy to be with you. God's face is connected with joy all throughout scripture in this way. And I think maybe we typically miss this in modern translations because they don't use Hebrew, but they use words that make sense in English. So it sometimes loses the potency from the original language. Here's some examples of that in Psalm 89, verse 15. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. In the Hebrew, in the light of your presence is literally in the light of your face. Blessed are those, you could say, who walk in the light of your face. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. In the Hebrew, the verse is rendered abundance of joy with your face. How many know God's face is really important as it relates to you and I? Psalm 21, six, you make him joyful with gladness in your presence. In the Hebrew, you make him happy and with joy with your face. The face of God brings joy. If you are sad and you are not glad today, let me give you this one, one tip. Seek the face of God. If you need joy today, seek God in his face. If you are stressed or even depressed, God is turning his face towards you. God is turning your face, his face towards you and he wants to give you peace and joy and he will even use others for his face to shine on you. His face can be seen in the face of others. We carry with us the light of the glory of Christ. Some of us just need to remind our face of that. Your face can bring blessing to someone else's face. Your heart, your words coming out of your face, that sounds a little weird, can bring blessing and glory to people. Pastor Sam at, at our Dunwoody location was telling me just a few days ago about a young man that's in his small group. And this young man had suffered some losses. And he was, in, uh, he, was, he was in a job that was just absolutely miserable for him. And so he just began to, to send out resumes and fill out applications and began to get some interviews and began to walk through the second and third phase of the interviews and had some really positive responses and results. But at the end of every one of those interviews was uh, a rejection. And on that, on one particular Wednesday, which is small group night for them, on one particular Wednesday, he'd had one of those rejections, one of those that he thought, this is it, this is it, and then he was rejected again. 
Pastor Sam was talking to him that afternoon, and he said, Pastor Sam, he said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming to small group tonight. I just, don't, I just don't feel like I can. How many of you ever heard somebody say that to you? I just don't feel like I can. How many of you know that ought to be a signal for you, just like it was for Pastor Sam to say, oh, no, 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 no. The thing you need right now is your small group. The thing you need right now, and Sam wouldn't say this, and I wouldn't say this. Maybe you would say this, but maybe not. The thing you need right now is to see my face. <laughs> the thing you need right now, we need, to get, we need to get up close with each other. Because when we see each other's face, the glory of God can shine through. We need to get to in a small group and begin to pray together. We need to get together and experience the glory of God together. And Pastor Sam said, would not take no for an answer. And that young man came to small group that night. And Pastor Sam said, that was such a special, special night at group. And he left there with a greater joy, obviously, than he had when he came. We need to help people not make those wrong decisions. We need to encourage people to take the right steps to experience the face of God to experience the blessing of God. You know why there's joy in the house of the Lord today? Not because they sang that song, but because you came. <laughs> because look around you. There's the people of God have gathered together. There's joy in the hearts of the people of God. And we won't be silent about that. We shouldn't be silent about that. We should be looking at one another, looking for opportunities to say, you know what, I am so happy to be with you today. <sighs> Oh, I felt so good. I'm so happy to be with you. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of our church family. You know, I know you expect the staff to say that, but I think we ought to be saying that to one another because here's what you don't know. Those things that you have going on underneath the hood, a lot of people have those, a lot of other people have those same things and more. And they're only here today by the grace of God. And what they need to know is there's somebody here that loves them like God loves them. And that, that there, there's someone here that cares deeply about their well-being. Well -being. And I've learned that when I reach out like that, it, it starts coming back to me. And all of a sudden there's this mutual edification going on. This mutual encouragement. And all of a sudden this mutual joy is generated. And for that person that might be right on the cusp or right on the edge of depression, now all of a sudden it's turned the other way. And they're beginning to be restored. They're beginning to be renewed because, Jerry, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the body of Christ. There's joy when we come together. There's joy in our small group. There's joy on our ministry teams. We're sensitive to one another. We discern one another. And God allows his joy to come through us as we're face to face with one another. But as we come before the Lord in his face, he releases his joy in a supernatural and a powerful way. I'm gonna ask you to do something with me, again, a little bit different, but I want us to close by us standing together and we're gonna sing in a moment, but before we sing, I just want us to stop and I just want us to experience the joy that can come when God turns his face towards us. See, here's what I believe. I believe his face has already been turned towards us today because we gathered together in his name. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there, his presence is here. We have felt it today, not just through the, the worship, but also I hope through the teaching of the word today and through being together, we have felt the presence of God. There's joy in his presence. His face is turned towards us. But here's what I'm praying for right now, that his face will impact your heart that his face, if you're in that place of sadness or despair, or you're just struggling right now and you don't know how to get out of that, that you will begin to move out of that today by the face of God impacting your heart. Would you just lift your hearts? And in fact, if you're comfortable with it, just lift up your hand or your hands, almost like you would if I was reciting that blessing over you and that you're receiving it. Because right now I'm asking that the face of God would be turned towards you, that the graciousness of God would be released to you, that the peace of God would re be released to you. But may the Lord bless you today. May the Lord keep you today. May the Lord make his face shine, that you might see and experience the glory and the rain of his power and his presence. May his face shine upon you. May he turn his face towards you right now. Turn your face towards us right now. 
Lord Jesus, give us peace. Give us joy for that person that's on the edge right now. They just don't know how to get a turn. God, move in their hearts right now. Reveal to them the truth of who you are. Reveal to them right now the truth of who they are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing right now. And I pronounce in the name of Jesus, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Come on, clap your hands. Let's rejoice in that truth and let's sing it together. Come on, right now. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout. are happy to be with you too. I want our prayer partners to run down here real quick because in a moment we're going to pray, but even as we pray, I'm going to invite you. If you're here today and you've just been struggling with some doubt and sadness and fear or whatever emotion it is, listen, the first thing, the first thing, yes, give it to God, but tell somebody about it. Tell one of our prayer partners about it. They're so happy to be with you. They would love for you to come and talk with them about it and let them pray for you and with you. God's face is turning towards you today. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed one more time, I just want to ask this one very, very important question. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God. And a lot of the things we've talked to you about today has just been a little bit foreign, except the part where there's sadness, there's pain, there's guilt, there's these emotions you don't know how to deal with. There's things on you that you know that you can't get free of by yourself because you've already tried. But also maybe you sense a real distance or disconnect from God. Listen, God loves you so much. He loves you just the way you are, but he doesn't want you to stay that way. He wants to transform you. He wants to give you life. He wants to bless you and keep you. He wants to show his grace to you in a powerful way. He wants to give you peace, but also he wants to give you hope for the future of an eternal life with him. If you're here today and you know there's sin in your life, you know if you were to die today, you're not sure that you would be ready to meet God, or maybe you know that you wouldn't. Now's your opportunity to say yes to Jesus. 100%, Jesus, I surrender to you. Jesus, I give you my all. I'm gonna invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. But if that's you, I just want you to identify yourself simply by lifting up your hand and put it right back down and then we're gonna pray together. How many of you say, Pastor Dave, I need Jesus. I need a relationship with God. I need to be restored to him. On the count of three, one, two, three. Lift your hand all over this room. Hands are going up, yes. People online, click that right there. Let us know, yes. Hands are going up. Praise God. Leave it up for just a moment. Awesome. 
from the front to the back, young and old. Let's pray together right now. If you lifted your hand, or even if you didn't, but you're ready to say yes to Jesus, you're ready to cross that line of faith right now. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, in fact, just say it with me and say it out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I recognize my need for you. I know that I've sinned. I know that I've gone my own way. I've tried to handle it all myself, but I can't. So I give my life to you. I surrender fully to you. I ask you to forgive me of all sin. Cleanse me. Wash me. Make me brand new on the inside. Jesus, I believe you died and rose again. And that your spirit now lives in me. I receive you as my Lord. I receive you as my Savior. And I commit to follow you. Help me now to live for you and experience your blessing, your joy and peace. And I'll tell other people about it in Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God.